Well, welcome to the Cary Institute's scientific seminar series. This is the first in our series for this spring. Following the academic tradition, we talk about the dead of winter as the spring to give us hope. And I'm delighted to show you what's, what's on the schedule for the next, next three weeks. Well, today I'm going to tell you in a little bit about our current speaker and her topic and background. But I bring to your attention that on February 10th and February 17th, we have two additional seminars scheduled. And you're more than welcome to attend those and the ones that follow on uh, the rest of the semester. We would invite you if um, you're not from Cary Institute and perhaps are attending for the first time to drop in the chat where you're from. It's always fun to hear where folks are from. We had hoped to have Karen live for this seminar, but COVID did not cooperate with that. But one of the advantages of having uh, a virtual seminar is you can get people attending from all over the world. So. Wherever you're from, if you're not uh, one of our regulars, drop in your, your location in the chat. If you have questions, which we can address at the end of the seminar in our question and answer period, please put those in the Q&A box. All right, that's not the chat. The chat is for technical things and saying hello. But if you have questions that you would like Karen to answer at the end of the seminar, please put those in the Q&A. All right, so I think we, I can now um, introduce Karen. Karen is the Hickson Professor of Geography and Urban Urbanization Science at Yale University School of the Environment. And she's really interested in global environmental change and its relationship to urbanization and really concerned with how urbanization affects the planet as a whole and, and its inhabitants of all sorts. She is really, um, her work is remarkable in that it's, it brings together remote sensing and field work and modeling to understand the global dynamics of urbanization, especially focusing on China and India, where she has worked respectively for 20 and 10 years. She's also been a leader in getting science into the hands of decision makers. She's one of the coordinating lead authors for the urban mitigation chapter in the IPCC sixth assessment report, which is currently underway. And there have been times when I've had um, hoped to get a chance to chat with Karen, and she's been busy with the IPP, IPCC. So um, that's a, a big job that she's doing for all our benefits. So I thank her for that. She's also been a member of uh, or particip participant in a lot of the National Research Council committees on population, environment, and global change. For example, she um, was on the committee that advised the U.S. Global Change Research Program. These are remember exactly exactly when, but it's lovely to have her within what about two hours from here. We hope to take advantage of that. She has won the Sustainability Science Award for the, from the Ecological Society of America, and she has also been awarded by the American Association of Geographers the, for outstanding contributions to remote sensing research. She's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and um, also a member of AAAS. And I really am delighted to, to tell you, and some of you know this already, that, that Carrie and Yale are working together on a, a collaboratory to deal with urban issues, urban knowledge, research, but also getting practitioners engaged in, in a knowledge sharing process. Her title today is Trends in Urbanization, Opportunities and Challenges for Sustainability. Karen, welcome. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks for such a nice introduction. And it's so nice to see so many participants from all around the world and also at Cary. And 
No, I, I'm just so sorry that I can't be there in person. When I was first invited to give a seminar, I said, yes, of course, I want to come visit your new building and uh, meet with folks. But hopefully um, I can still come sometime in the near future. So what I thought I would do today is give a little bit of a, um, a salad bar approach to the work that we do in my lab. A little bit um, following on what Stuart said about Carrie and Yale developing this new urban collaboratory, I thought that giving this salad bar overview would provide some hopefully entry points for thinking about how we might collaborate going into the future. So just to put urbanization into a uh, into perspective, um, we are now in a world where the majority of the population lives in urban areas, but it wasn't this way pretty recently. As recently as 1950, we had fewer than 1 billion people living in cities and towns. Um, and now we have about 4.2 billion. So that's about 55% of the global population. And it's estimated that by the middle of the century, we're going to add about another two and a half billion people into cities and towns. What does this look like? Um, so this is a picture for, of Shanghai in the 80s, and this is Shanghai today. This is really dramatic. It's a mega city. But I just want to underscore that urbanization is happening all around the world and, and not just very large cities like these. It's also happening in smaller towns. This is a picture taken um, um, of in Cherokon in Nepal, where I've been doing some field work. This is a picture from the early 90s. And this is um, more recently in Sherikot. So you know, urbanization looks really different depending on um, different parts of the world. But just to underscore that it is happening even in remote highlands in the Himalaya. In terms of, so you know, we're, we're already an urbanized society. More than half of us live in these uh, cities and towns. I wanted to highlight a couple of trends that are especially important if we think about the urban impacts on the planet and on um, how the earth functions. And one of this is changes in household size. So on the one hand, the urban population is growing on average at about 1.3 million people every, every single week, 1.3 million more people moving into cities and towns. But on the other hand, the other trend we're seeing is that average household size is actually declining. And here I have some data for five countries. Uh, you can see in the, for the US, our average household size in the 1960s was about three and a half. And now we're down to about two and a half. And you know, the, depending on the country we're looking at, this y-axis might differ, or actually it would differ. So if we were looking at the continent of Africa, these numbers would be much higher, closer to about seven. Um, and in Asia, they're larger as well. But nonetheless, the trends would be the same all around the world. So this is really important because household sizes are declining while urban populations are increasing. Another trend is that even though household sizes are declining, new home sizes are actually increasing. So I immigrated to the US in 1974 and average home size was around 1600 back then. And today new homes are almost 3000 square feet. And again, the Y axis would differ depending on what country we're looking at, but the trend would be the same. And so these three trends around urbanization, new home sizes being larger, household sizes declining, and, and urban populations increasing, all of those are converging to have a pretty big impact on what urbanization, uh, of what urbanization means. So here's a picture uh, of uh, just outside of Bangalore, another area that I've been looking at, where you see this kind of North American style single family home. Um, and then here's another picture uh, taken uh, outside of Beijing, uh, again, you know, single family homes. So this is a trend that's happening all around the world. And 
a, a really big question, if we think about the impact of urbanization on the environment is, what does this mean in terms of transformation in industries, transformations in livelihoods and lifestyles? Um, and a really big question that has, has uh, been the focus for a lot of economic studies is this question of, you know, is urbanization inevitable? And what does this mean for economic development? Because we know that a, a large, a, a big aspect of the urban impacts on the environment does is filtered through uh, the income effect. And you can see in this chart that as a country becomes more urban, essentially what happens is um, the, the country's percentage of the GDP coming from agriculture declines really quickly. But the percentage of the labor force leaving agriculture actually uh, doesn't change as quickly. And so what this means in terms of the impacts on urbanization is as countries are urbanizing, their economies are transforming much faster than their labor force. And so there is this lag effect in terms of the impacts on, on well-being, inequality, um, getting people out of poverty. So my work is taking all of these trends and putting them situating them in a global change context. Um, I wanna just highlight this, um, this, this article that I, I'm sure many people on this call are quite familiar with. This, it's really a canon in the literature, uh, Peter Vitusik's article on global change. And in that article, he talks about global change as having two different components. He says that there's global change that alter well-mixed fluid envelopes of the earth system. And so examples of these are things like climate change, ozone hole, um, ocean acidification. But he also says that there's a different kind of, a different type of, a second type of global change. And these are those that occur in discrete sites, but are so widespread to, so to constitute a global change. And so he lists these three other types of global changes, land use change, biodiversity loss, uh, changes in atmospheric chemistry. So these are things that are happening all around the world, but if we aggregate them, they're so widespread that they constitute global change. And I would argue that urbanization is occurring in so many discrete sites, but the, on aggregate, their impacts are so widespread that we need to think about urbanization as global environmental change. And so that's how I situate my work. So my lab, the work that we do really looks at five key questions. So one big question is to understand how is urbanization changing the biosphere? And for this, we use primarily different types of satellite data as Stuart mentioned. We use a variety of different types of satellite data, primarily NASA assets. And we develop algorithms to understand how urban land cover and land use changes is occurring all around the world. And this little picture um, gives an example of how we're looking at this. Um, we're, we're using, increasingly, we're using the entire archive that's available. So for every single satellite image, there could be 300 to 500 and sometimes even more images for each scene. And so we generate these very large data rich uh, data sets to map um, how these urban uh, systems are changing all around the world. And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is uh, some data that we have for India. This, what you see all these black dots here are for a single pixel. And you can see that this, you know, there's a lot of variation in this, you know, this, this one single pixel from 1990 up to the present. There's a lot of variation, but in the algorithms that we develop, we can actually see that despite all this variation over time, there are actually statistically significant breaks that we see in the data set. So you can see that there's a break somewhere around 1997, there's a break around 2005, there's a break around 2014. And what we do is we actually go into the field to understand what, what are these breaks that we see in the data, what do they correspond with on the ground? 
And so we develop, um, we, we develop algorithms where we're looking at the entire time series um, of the satellite data. And we try to take out um, a seasonal component. We try to extract the trend component and the air component so that we can identify where these, you know, when these breaks occur and uh, so that we can understand, you know, what are the impacts of urban land change on things like agricultural land loss and on things like habitat loss, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit. The second big question that we ask is, what drives these changes that we observe with the satellite data? And for this type of work, we, we do a lot of field work where we actually interview households, but we also use um, uh, data from uh, the census and surveys to understand what are the proximate drivers of urban land change, such as the development of infrastructure like roads and, and housing. Um, but there's also, we also want to understand what are the more underlying drivers of urban land change, such as policies in, in FDI, or maybe changes in markets, um, migration. Um, so we want to look at these various different uh, drivers of urban land change. Then the third major types of question that we look at is, how does urbanization, how does it affect global environmental change? And three of the big buckets of work that we do include looking at urban impacts on biodiversity. And most of this is more at the global scale. So we're looking at how global patterns of urbanization affect habitat and biodiversity. We also look at the impacts on food systems. And then also a lot of work, our work is looking at how urbanization at scale, again, at national to global scale, what that might mean for energy use and carbon emissions. And then the flip side of that is how do large scale environmental changes, how does that actually affect urbanization? That's a, a big focus of our lab is understanding how global change now actually feeds back into the urban system. And again, our lens is at this global scale. How is this, act so what, one example is work that one of my doctoral students did for his dissertation here, Chris Chagru, where he looked at the global spread of uh, cyclones and how that actually penetrates through urban trade networks and urban supply chains um, to cascade through cities all around the world. A lot of the lens, a, a lot of the the, the lens of, of uh, climate resilience and climate adaptation, a lot of that literature currently focuses on how individual cities might be affected by climate change and might adapt to climate change. But the work in um, of Chris and, and, and his dissertation found that, in fact, a lot of these impacts that affect one city ripple through the supply chain, ripple through trade networks to actually affect cities all the around the world. So this requires us to rethink what we mean by adaptation. And certainly a lot of the discussion has been on, for example, coastal cities or sea level rise. But this work actually shows that even if you're not on the coast and if you are connected through supply chains, your city and your town could be strongly affected by a hurricane or a cyclone or a pandemic elsewhere. And interestingly enough, now with a pandemic, I think you know, the issue of supply chains and bottlenecks, you know, it's in our, our discourse pretty regularly. But this work does require us to rethink what we mean by adaptation. And then the, the lastly, the fifth key question that we look at is we do a lot of scenario work. We, we try to understand what are future scenarios of urbanization and what are their implications on things like biodiversity and energy use? So we develop spatially explicit models that forecast future urban patterns of development. So that's an overview of the work that we do. And what I'd like to do in the remaining time is um, zoom in on three different examples of, of urbanization impacts and challenges for land, food, and for climate. So I'll start off talking about land, and I'll start off talking about this forecast work that we do. 
um, because it 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 really anchors a lot of the work that we're we're currently working on. And I want to start off by describing a model that we developed uh, actually more than ten years ago now, where we developed the first ever global model that um, is a global spatially explicit forecast of urban expansion. And so for this model, what we did was we combined a number of uh, publicly available data sets such as the UN World Urban Projections. Um, um, and we combined those with IPCC scenarios about future, um, future economic development, and we developed a model uh, where we were able to project GDP per capita because it turns out that GDP per capita is a strong uh, a cor a correlate with how much land, uh, how much urban land is needed. And so we developed a forecast of GDP per capita, and then we developed a, a, a relationship between the GDP per capita and then how much land would be needed by different regions, different, uh, different populations around the world. And so once we had this estimate of how much land, or really not single estimate, but many estimates of how much land would be needed, we developed, used a different model to spatialize that. So we spatially, you know, you can see here on the left, we had a number of different input data, such as you know, slope, uh, uh, access to roads, um, existing urban areas, et cetera. And then we spatialized this model, uh, these data to, to forecast uh, future urban land. And so the output is something like this, where we, were, uh, we forecasted global urban land extent going out to 2030. And you know, it's interesting, looking back at this model now, um, it was a very crude model. Um, at its time, but it was novel in that at that time, there were no other models that forecasted urban land expansion globally. Um, and so we were the first one that, that did this. And one of the main results was that urban land um, expansion going out to 2030 is, was forecasted to be really significant about the size of you know, the entire country of Mongolia. And it equated to you can see here about 20,000 American football fields becoming urban every single day for 30 years. And when we compared our model with some other studies out there, we could see that on average, the, the model actually, um, you know, in some ways, in some respects overestimates, but in some places actually underestimates. And what we did with that model then was we, we looked at these future estimates of urban expansion. And we took some published data on biodiversity hotspots. And we looked to see how, where are the biodiversity hotspots, which ones, and how will they be affected by future urban expansion? And you can see here, what I've done is I've highlighted a handful of ones where um, at least 3% of the hotspot will be affected by urban expansion. And I'm gonna come back to this in just a minute because we've updated this, uh, this model. So that model over 10 years old was, was pretty basic, pretty crude. And what we did was we updated that model and we updated it and improved it in two really critical ways. And one is that um, we recalibrated it to observe something called Ziff's law, which is um, basically this really interesting law uh, that basically if you were to take the rank of all the cities in a country, um, they follow this linear pattern where if you take the rank um, and the size, you know, they, they, they follow this really uh, uh, interesting uh, pattern. So we recalibrated the model to observe the, the, the rank size rule. And then what we also did was re recalibrated the model to uh, um, account for the newest IPCC SSP scenarios. And so these SSP scenarios are storylines of what the future might look like. And so in SSP1, and so this is important, in SSP1, the, the future is one where the world is gonna be, we're, we're gonna be much more sustainable. In SSP5, um, the, the world is more, more like the world today, but we're really focused on technology and we're not focused on um, mitigating climate change. And in SSP3, 
um, that's where we're going to see a significant downturn in economic development. So we recalibrated the model, improved it significantly, and then we extended the storyline out to 2050. And so this is the newest output that we uh, produced a couple of years ago. Um, and this data set I wanted to note to everyone on the call is available on our website. You can download the data layers um, and, and use it for your own research. So one of the interesting things in this, um, in, when we look at the results is that the majority of the expected future expansion is going to take place in temperate areas. And the other thing that's interesting is, you know, remember what I said about SSP1 and SSP5. I mean, those are almost two extremes in, the, in, in these futures. SSP5 um, and, and 1, however, if you look at here at the scenarios, they actually aren't that different. They're not that statistically different. But what is really different is only under a scenario where there's significant decline in economic development, do we see a really big difference in future um, urban expansion. And now with COVID, we're now revisiting the model um, and, and thinking about what future urban expansion might look like under a pandemic or maybe even under endemic circumstances. So you know, here's a map that, that spatializes the, the table um, in terms of looking at how urban caused um, habitat loss might look like all around the world. And you can see that it's really concentrated. I mean, the large areas where urbanization is gonna cause a lot of habitat loss is concentrated in a, in a handful of countries. But one of the things that we were really interested in is understanding how policies might stem uh, future urban impacts on biodiversity and habitat loss. And so we did an institutional analysis to understand you know, what is the state of governance and institutions in these places where urban expansion impacts on biodiversity are expected to be high. The bad news here is that in many of these countries, the governance and the institutional quality is actually really low. And so the ability for governments to actually steer what future urbanization may look like, to use policies like zoning, actually are not even in place. And so we developed a framework for thinking about what conservation strategies might look like for different types of countries that have very different levels of land governance and institutional quality. And here I wanna just have us take a look at the bottom part of this chart of this, um, of, of this matrix. So here on this X axis, this is where urban growth impacts on biodiversity are high, but where land governance is actually low. And so, you know, in a lot of the literature on urbanization and biodiversity, there's a lot of focus you know, at the end of an article where researchers say, well, we need to just start zoning and siting for protected areas. Well, that's great if institutions are in place for zoning and are able to implement land policies. But what we found was in a lot of these countries where urbanization and urban expansion will have a greatest impact on habitat loss, they actually have very weak land governance. And so in these countries, what we need to think about focusing on are strengthening political stability, uh, reducing corruption, increasing the stability of the economic system, as well as thinking about things like building capacity through public participation and international aid. So this is really different from just you know, a really simple uh, strategy through zoning or, you know, developing protected areas. So this is work that we're doing with uh, researchers at uh, the TNC to think about how future patterns of urbanization might affect biodiversity and what are long-term and also short-term short conservation strategies that might, um, that might stem and might actually um, stem and, and, and reduce these impacts before they even um, uh, get manifested. So 
The second big bucket I want to focus on today is looking at urbanization's impacts on food systems. So years ago, um, Hal Mooney sent me this photo, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming many of many on the call are familiar and know Hal. And he, and he emailed me this picture and he said, Karen, is this real? And what are we going to do about this? And um, that email exchange with Hal set in motion a, um, <laughs> an entire research uh, program in my lab uh, where we've been looking now at urbanization's impacts on food systems. Um, and you know this picture that Hal sent me is from taken from China. And you can see really clearly you know, urban development abutting agricultural land. Um, and so we started this enterprise where we started looking to see how future urban expansion would affect existing agricultural land. So this is a, a report, this is a, a paper that we published um, about six years ago where we used the 2030 forecasts. We haven't updated this analysis with the 2050 forecast, um, but the global picture is, a, is an okay one. Um, and I wanna, I wanna just point out that this particular study, it takes our urban forecasts and what we do is we take uh, different data sets of existing cropland and we look to see how future expansion would affect croplands and yields and the types of agricultural land that's most at risk. An important limitation of this study is that we don't assume any new agricultural land that's being brought into production. And so if we just look at existing cropland, what you see is that future urban expansion as predicted by our model is estimated to result in about a 2% loss of existing cropland. But importantly is that this cropland is on average more productive than, than um, national averages. So globally, the picture is not that bad, only about 2% of, of, of croplands. But if you look at specific countries and specific regions, it's a completely different story. And so if you look at a country like Egypt or Vietnam, we estimate that Egypt will lose over one third of its cropland. We estimate that Vietnam will lose about 10% of its cropland. And so think back to that graph that I showed about agriculture and um, changes in agricultural GDP. So what we're expecting is that as these countries lose a large percentage of their cropland, this is gonna have significant impacts on livelihoods. Um, and there'll be a lag effect because farmers are, you know, there's gonna be a loss of farmland, but then farmers are gonna lo lose their livelihoods many of them are likely to move to cities or towns to look for alternative forms of employment. And I think this is now more of a political science or economics question about what that means in terms of political stability in these countries if a large percentage of their um, agricultural labor force are unable to uh, find employment in cities. Um, the African continent is estimated to lose a significant portion of uh, their main cash crop. So you can see, uh, we estimate that they're gonna lose up to about 25%, 26% of their wheat production and about 19% of their rice production. So this is gonna be really significant for the African continent. And I think there are some really interesting um, issues here around what this means for other ecosystems, not agriculture, but clearly as they lose this agricultural land to urbanization, other types of land will have to be brought into production to make up for the loss in yields, and then really importantly, to make up for the loss in uh, national GDP. But there's a flip side of urban impacts on um, food systems that my lab is also looking at, which is on the demand side. Um, and so in the literature, there's a very large literature about the nutrition transition, how um, as economies become richer, as our households become richer, we go from um, eating forageable, foraging for plants 
uh, to legumes, to grains, to, um, to dairy and processed sugar, to meats. And this is all over the nutrition literature. But what's interesting from my perspective is that this literature primarily equates urbanization's impact on nutrition transition with economic development. And so I wanted to ask the question, well, what is the urban impact? Not what is the wealth impact, but what is the urban impact? What, is, what can we really attribute to urban impacts on changes in diet? So we started off looking um, at national data, and now we've been looking at more detailed data for, um, for a couple of countries. Um, one thing is definitely uh, clear from the data, which is that as a country's population becomes more urban, and so these are now data for different for countries, so every single dot represents a country. Um, as a country's population becomes more urbanized, there's a very strong correlation with the amount of food that's eaten away from home. So um, we, we tend to eat at our work, other than now at the pandemic, many of us are working from home, um, but there's a strong correlation between food away from home and urban populations. And there's also a very strong correlation between urban population and food waste. But there's a different urban transition that's happening as well um, that's related to diets. So there's food away from home, there's more convenient food, um, but there's also a, a lot more processed foods. And we're seeing that um, happening, especially with uh, in countries where urbanization is, is high, but economic development is actually relatively low, that there's a lot more processed food that's being consumed. This is some data um, that we uh, uh, looked at for uh, the country of India. One thing that was really interesting is if you look at uh, variation in processed foods and food away from home, that's in the bottom graph here, this is the food away from home, there's actually a lot of variation between countries. So it's not enough simply to say urban populations eat more food away from home and they eat more processed foods. There's actually a lot of variation within cities. And my suspicion and hypothesis is that a lot of this has to do with the nature of the economy, but a lot of this actually has to do with the layout of cities, the structure of the built environment, and the, 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 the convenience of being able to access food, um, and, and again, the, the structure of the built environment. But we're doing more work in this area. I want to end with a third area of work that we're doing around uh, urban and urbanization and climate. And here, the work that we're doing is at two different scales. Um, on the one hand, what we're doing is we're, we're looking at um, urban, urban energy use and urban carbon emissions. Uh, this is work that was led by a, a group in uh, Norway that our lab collaborative, collaborated with, where we found that a very large share of the carbon footprint is actually generated by a very small percentage of the, uh, the global population. And if we look um, specifically at cities, one of the key findings of this paper was that the top 100 emitting cities account for about 18% of the global carbon footprint. So yes, on the one hand, urban areas contribute about three quarters of uh, fossil fuel carbon emissions. However, if we just look at um, the 100 emitting cities, they account for a really large percentage of the carbon footprint. So if we think about policies for just these 100 cities, that could actually make a really big dent in lowering the, um, the global carbon footprint. But this is for existing cities. This is not for future cities. And so what I want to have us think about is you know, future cities and what that future cities could mean for future energy use. Um, and so this is work that shows that if we look at future urban expansion scenarios, again, linking with the earlier work that I showed, under a business as usual scenario. And this business as usual scenario is the trends that I talked about earlier, smaller household size, larger average home size, more 
urban land per person, um, a, a low density sprawling type of development. Under these types of business as usual scenarios, we expect that urban energy use is going to increase more than threefold. So this is important for thinking about future urban emissions and climate change. And there's a lot of potential to change how cities in the future will be developed. But if we think back to the work that we did on biodiversity, a lot of the countries where future urban expansion will be the greatest are also countries where there's very weak land governance. And so that means that there's a very low capacity to shape future urban development. Um, unless there are some pretty big uh, changes in governance and institutions of land and urban systems. If we think about um, the, the future urban development, there's uh, an impacts on energy and emissions. There's the operational energy use part of it, but there's also an embodied energy use component to this. And so what we've been doing is we have used satellite data and different types of satellite data to characterize the two and also the three dimension, uh, the three dimension volumetric growth of cities. And by volumetric growth, what I mean is, you know, how much verticality is there in future cities and in existing cities. So here are some results that uh, for, for Indian cities and what you see here on the X axis what this shows is horizontal growth, how much of cities are growing in, a, in an outward expansion. What you see on this y-axis, this is now the volumetric growth. And the different colors show how much of a particular area was urbanized um, in an earlier period. Um, and so what you see here is in these Indian cities, a lot of this, you know, these gray arrows, what they're showing is a lot of the Indian cities are growing outward. And these gray arrows indicate that these places were not urban uh, um, uh, before, but they are now urbanized now. The color arrows, not surprisingly, you know, so the color arrows, these purple and blues, these are arrows that are places that were already urban um, in, in, in the 90s. And so, you know, if you're already urban, you have no place to grow but up, upwards. Um, but the key message in this image or these results is that Indian cities are primarily growing outward right now. There are a few cities that are growing upward in this vertical dimension, um, but they're primarily growing outward. And so you can interpret this as places like Hyderabad and Bangalore are having a really big impact on land, land systems. But places like uh, Delhi uh, are having a big impact in terms of changes in energy use uh, because of their built environment. If we look at African cities, it's a very similar story, although you see that these arrows are much shorter, much smaller. And so African cities are, they're, they're, more, they're many more discrete cities, um, and, and really, really they're more like towns growing out of villages. So there are many more discrete places. But the other thing that's really interesting in these African cities is that there's very little verticality. So African cities are by and large, really low rise and very flat. So if we think about their operational and embodied energy, there's very low embodied energy and relatively low future operational energy use. The next slide I'm gonna show is for Chinese cities. And I want you, I'm just gonna ask everybody to think for a moment of what you think the slide is gonna look like. All right, so Chinese cities, um, a lot of verticality. I already showed the picture of uh, Shanghai earlier. So you can see the arrows are very long, but they're very colorful. To, and, and that indicates that a lot of Chinese cities or at least the ones that I show here, uh, they're growing upward over places that are already urbanized. Uh, so that's one dimension of the climate story that we're working on. Um, the other dimension is looking at how urban expansion will exacerbate the, uh, the urban heat island effect. Um, and so this is work done by another one of my doctoral students where he developed these forecasts going out to 2050 and looked at how 
2050, the urban expansion will change daytime temperatures. And the key message here is that for many parts of the world, urban expansion is going to exacerbate the global climate signal. And in some places, the urban expansion induced signal will actually be larger than the global warming climate signal. So in other words, land-based warming will be greater than emissions-based warming, warming for many parts of the world. And if we think about adaptation, there's, um, there's a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of challenges ahead, especially for uh, countries in the global south that are located in the tropics. Uh, what we find is that uh, there are a number of countries um, in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, where urban expansion uh, uh, warming is going to have a really big impact, but these are also places that have fewer financial resources to adapt. And these are also places that have fewer financial resources to, to invest in things like air conditioning and infrastructure. Um, so I want to end here. Um, I just want to highlight one just very quickly that we have other work being done in the lab where we're looking at global patterns of the wildland urban interface and pathogen spillover that's done work, but that's work that's being done by uh, another doctoral student of mine. Um, we're also continuing this work on teleconnected risks through the urban trade networks. And then we have a large program in the lab looking at um, urban energy infrastructure, who has access to energy um, and how consistent do they have access to energy um, infrastructure. I do want to end on a positive note because I recognize that the title of my talk was opportunities and challenges and, and I've primarily just talked about challenges, but I think this is really the largest opportunity. And that is that more than 60% of the projected urban areas have yet to be built. And despite not having strong governance or institutions in place, I am an optimist at heart. And I know that um, there's a large opportunity to bring science to bear on how these future cities will be uh, developed. So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to um, a conversation and Q&A. Karen, thank you so much. It was good that the, my, my um, camera was off, otherwise everybody would have been distracted by my vigorous nodding throughout. Um, so much great stuff there. Let's, let's see what's in the, the, the question and answer there. Let me see here. All right, now I can't get it big. There we go, I've got it too big. Um, Evan Gora asks, um, very interesting work. Could you comment on the contributions of immigration to cities versus birth rates within cities to increasing urbanization? Does this vary geographically? And are those relative rates expected to shift in the future? Uh, so Evan, I should say I am not a demographer. And so I'm not looking at birth rates versus immigration rates. Um, the work that we do on these models, we take the urbanization rates as a given. And these urbanization rates that the UN develops, these, you know, these forecasts they, they develop are based on the points that you raised, you know, migration, birth rates, death rates, et cetera, but we're not looking at that. Um, that said, I can say from my field work and um, other work that we've done is that there's a big variation in migration patterns um, around the world, clearly. Um, what's interesting is that most of the two city migration, the data that we've looked at shows that most of the migration to cities actually happen from very nearby places. First of all, they're within country. So the international migration to cities is actually a very, very small percentage of movement into cities. So that's an important point. But that most of the movement to cities, migration to cities, actually occurs within country borders and actually occurs within pretty close, relatively close proximity. So that people, you know, what happens is people move from the countryside to the nearest big city, 
And then from there, they move to the next big city. There is a bit of a hopscotching that occurs um, in many parts of the world, at least in the parts of the world that I'm studying. Thanks a lot for that. One of the things that I have to say, sort of from the other side, looking at specific cities, often you find that um, that immigration from whatever sources, but very often international immigration is actually a driver of, of vitality in, in individual cities very often. Sarah, I'm, I'm going to ask also if if people do continue to have questions, please put them in the Q and A and chat, so I don't have to look at too many places at once. Sarah Batterman asks, super interesting work. I was struck by how cities in China were growing up, while cities in India and the continent of Africa are growing out. Why do you think there is this difference? Yeah, well, that's a question I can definitely answer. Um, and, and I had a slide to show this, but I took it out in the interest of time. So. China started its urban transition really in the 80s, really within the 80s with uh, the opening up of its economy. And, and you can argue that China's going through maybe a third or maybe even a fourth wave of urbanization right now, where if you think about their first wave in the 80s as with, with, um, with economic uh, liberalization, a lot of, they really invested in infrastructure. A lot of their cities uh, grew quickly but a lot of the infrastructure was not well built. And so what's happening now is they are rebuilding a lot of that infrastructure. That's why you see that verticality is they're rebuilding over um, existing cities. India, on the other hand, um, India will only reach its peak urbanization in the middle of the, of the century. So India's pattern of urban development is just starting to ramp up. India is still primarily a rural country. Um, and, and the urbanization that's occurring there is really in, in the capital cities of the different states, but it's at a totally different scale um, than China. And then Africa is, is uh, even a little bit uh, behind India in terms of uh, the time trajectory. Um, and so you know, a lot of the urban development that's happening in India and, and Africa especially is much more informal urban development. It's not state-led. A lot of it is more bottom-up. Um, in Africa, what we're seeing is a lot of the development is not with uh, state-led investments in infrastructure. So really different patterns uh, depending on going back to um, investments, but also uh, issues around governance and, um, and institutions, which is why understanding, you know, what the drivers are is really important because these impacts on the planet are really, really different, but we have to go all the way back to their drivers. Yeah. But thanks for that question. I'm going to sort of combine two questions that deal with agriculture here. Um, Michelle Wong asks, do you think that the conversion of agricultural lands to urban land will push agricultural systems to be efficient or that this will create more pressure on, 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 blah, 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 on unmanaged lands? And that relates to another question we have about the how to avoid a lack of food supply being a, a, a break on, on urbanization. That's from J.Y. Kush. So I'm kind of combining those. Yeah, so the first question about uh, the impacts of um, urban on um, pushing agricultural lands, you know, absolutely it's gonna have an impact on putting more pressure on unmanaged lands. And we're already seeing that. Um, there's a, another analysis that we've done that I didn't show today, which is starting to look at, uh, you know, the, the, the knock-on effects of the loss of agricultural land. What does this mean for needing to expand? And this new er land expansion of agriculture is taking place on forested areas, on, uh, on habitats. Your question about whether it's going to force or push ag systems to be more efficient, um, that's a much more difficult question. Um, because you know, what do we mean by efficiency of the agricultural system? In a lot of places in the global south, uh, they're actually already very, very efficient. Um, the question is whether they can increase their yields uh, 
Um, and I think that's a really different question as well, because a lot of the investments in increasing yields in places like in China have taken place by consolidating farms, but also investing in um, uh, petrochemical, petrochemicals and, and fertilizers. So there's, I think, a different kind of pressure on ecosystems uh, from trying to make existing agricultural systems more productive. Um, and then I think there was another question about uh, uh, food supply. Is that what you said, Stuart? Yeah, uh, let me read that. How, how to avoid the lack of food supply. Um, I think, well, maybe I should re rephrase this a little bit. How can the reduction in food supply that may attend to the, the uh, displacement of agricultural lands, how, can, how does that relate to the trajectories of city development? Sort of right. turn the question around. Yeah, well, if I understand that question correctly, um, most cities are not de deriving their food supply from their immediate surroundings, right? And so um, that said, most of a country's food supply comes from within country. So um, even though there's a lot of international trade, a lot of that trade is of the main, main, main things like grains, uh, meats, uh, but, you know, the, the, the vegetables that you eat, you know, they're actually primarily grown within a particular country of fruits and vegetables. Um, and so the issue of lack of food supply wouldn't be directly around the immediate development of the city on the existing agricultural land. There would still be trade within a country. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. There's a, a question from... Anachal Vidya Sagar, and it is, um, blue-green infrastructure has been proved to be an effective way of mitigating urban heat island effects. Which city or state or region, uh, at, according to you, would be a most successful example of this? Oh, uh, there are so many different examples. Um, well, first of all, I should say that I don't work in the U.S., so I have no, ex I have no idea what city in the U.S. is doing what, and I'm sure there are other folks on the call who are more familiar with this. Uh, there are lots of examples. I'm not going to pick a city, but I will say that um, a couple of the most uh, successful or quote successful examples, I would say, certainly would be uh, there are a number of Chinese cities that have um, intentionally used parks and tree canopy as a way to reduce the urban heat island. Um, and also using uh, a wetlands. Um, a number of Indian cities are using wetlands and protecting wetlands as a way to, uh, to, um, uh, to re reduce stormwater impacts. Um, in China, there's a big push towards uh, rehabilitating uh, wetlands um, that are around in and around cities and also using this concept of sponge cities, which are essentially uh, using blue and green infrastructure. Uh, primarily using green space. I mean, using green space, um, but there are a lot of examples. So I would be able to, you know, highlight one or two. It wouldn't be fair for all the other ones that are doing so much. I'm um, looking at the clock and we have more questions than we have time. And so pardon me for, for picking one uh, of the many that I could. Barbara Hahn asks, does urbanization tend to follow a quote succession pathway for a scropland suburb city or is urbanization equally likely, likely for these forms of land use over time? Do the pathways quote, pathways of urb to urbanization vary geographically in the global south versus developed western uh, temperate areas? I love that question. Um, I love that question because we have a paper where we debunk this succession pathway. So um, uh, there is a paper on global consequences of land use that I'm sure many people on this call are familiar with fully at all from, I can't remember what year, maybe 98 or something. And in that article, they have this, um, this, uh, you know, this land use succession pathway, right? Exactly what Barbara mentions, right? So there's like, forest to crops to city and, 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 and that's it, it's very linear. Um, and we can sh show with data that that's not how it happens, uh, certainly not in the global south. 
it might, that might be the pattern in Western societies in the US and Europe where cities emerged out of forested areas and right um, from crop, crop areas. I mean, there's certainly a case to be made that villages and agricultural communities, you know, have this successional path from forested areas or from wildlands. But what we actually see is that it's not linear and that there's a lot of flip-flopping. And part of that relates to the question about migration, that in a, many global South uh, cities and towns, there is this circular migration, there's seasonal migration. So people are partly in the countryside and have a rural livelihood, but they're partly in the city for part of the year or part of their household. And so there, you know, towns can be can also be agricultural areas, can also be cities. And so uh, there is this flip-flopping, so to speak. Um, and if we look over a, a longer time horizon, so if we look at literally, I'm thinking of over thousands of years, we see that cities actually follow a, a, a rise and fall. You know, we, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the US about Detroit shrinking. There are cities in Europe that are shrinking. But there's, if you look at the archeological literature, cities have always done this. They've always been growing and shrinking. And so, um, you know, what that means you know, that in terms of succession pathway, I would argue that, uh, yes, on the one hand, there could be this linear path for some places, but that's certainly not, the, it doesn't hold for every single place. It's more like a, I've been thinking about this as a Kondratiev curve cycle, right? Of up and down, and it really relates to economic development and um, migration as well. I mean, this is a much longer dis discussion, but a really great question. Thank you for that. Well, we are unfortunately out of time, so I apologize to the people whose questions we did not get to. And uh, Karen, thank you so much for a really brilliant seminar. So great day, everybody. Thanks thank for you. joining. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks all. Bye.